Good morning, family. We are still in Psalms uh, 119. Uh, we're going to uh, start in verse 80. Uh, I think that uh, it's important that we truly understand what we're supposed to be doing and listening to and reading. In verse 80, it says, Let my heart be sound in thy statutes. When it says sound, it doesn't mean noises. It's talking about being set, being rock solid in our understanding of all the things that pertain to something. And when it says sound in thy statutes, it would be similar to hearing a pastor today saying sound in doctrine. In other words, we have to understand what the doctrine is, what Jesus taught, what he made uh, open for us to understand. It says, why, why would you need to know about the statutes? Why would you need to know about the law of God? Well, it says, I be not ashamed. In other words, we're, we're put in a position where we need to know what God thinks and what God teaches and what God expects us to know so that we are not ashamed. If somebody comes up and says, hey, well, you know, we can do this, and you can say, well, yeah, I guess you could, but, you know, the Word of God says you're not supposed to. Well, no. Somebody says, hey, let's, let's get together and, and lie about, you know, what we're going to do today so that, you know, we, we're all in the same book, that we all understand that we're all lying about that. No, you need to be strong in what you understand about the gospel, about the truth, about what God says, Jesus says, so that there is no, there's, there's no gray area. It's black and white. I've been told by my ex that, I, there's no gray in me. It's only black and white. Well, I think that could be a good thing, uh, not necessarily a bad thing, because I don't want to compromise the Word of God. I don't want to say, well, I guess you could get away with it because, you know, the commandments were the Old Testament, we're the New Testament, we're supposed to be living under grace and mercy, and so therefore, you know, I guess I could, you know, do this or do that, and whatever. We are the children of God, and God expects us to act as his children. So in verse 81, it says, My soul fainteth for thy salvation. In other words, it's a longing. It's, if, you know, if you've been outside working like Charlie has been on the, on the driveway um, in the parking lot, you're at a point where after, you know, an hour or so, I mean, you're worn out. You need to go sit down, and you need to take in some water and be refreshed. Well, that's the kind of fainting it's talking about. It's been, you need to be refreshed. You need to be uh, brought back to life. You need to uh, understand and take in those things that are necessary for your life. When it says, my soul fainteth for thy salvation, you're, you're longing for it. You're, you need it. You have to have it in order to be able to even survive for that day, for that moment. And when, you're, when your soul fainteth, there is no strength of itself. It comes from the Word of God. It comes from His Word, His doctrines, His precepts, His teachings. And those are the things that, as we apply them to our life, if we're being confused or if we're, if we're down because we're depressed and whatever, when you read the Word of God and you see that you're an overcomer, that you don't have to bow down to the things in this earth that, that tear you down, because we're higher than that. God has put within us the Spirit of God so that our life is not just in the things around us, but it's in the, it's in the law of the Word, it's in, the, in God's precepts, and it's in His directions. It's in the things that He has given as an example of what we're supposed to be doing on a daily basis. 82, mine eyes fail for thy Word. You, you need to be reading His Word, because as you read the Word, it's encouraging. It makes, you in, it makes you the kind of person that God wants you to be because you are no longer looking to yourself to resolve problems and to have the answers. 
You're looking to God's word to show you what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be reacting. You're not doing it on man's precepts and man's thoughts. Hey, you know, go ahead and do what you want, need to do today because, hey, God will f- forgive you and, you know, do. No, yeah, that's man's thoughts. Man's thoughts are, are so low that because of sin that it, it doesn't even reach the temple of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't even reach the, the location where our Father in Heaven is. It's, it's guttural, it's low, it's, it's horrible in the sense that we think it's got merit. It has no merit. The only merit is doing those things that God expects us to do. All through these, this uh, psalm, it continually brings out things about his word, his, his uh, statutes, his precepts, his laws. It's, it, keep, as we read this, keep paying attention to how it keeps going back to the very laws and the things that God has established as being the means, the norm for what we're supposed to be doing. For I am become like a bottle in the smoke. In other words, you're open, you're an you're empty vessel that needs to be filled up with God's things. In the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? Well, the judgment is based on what? His laws, his precepts. The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrong. They, being people, they persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. They had almost consumed me upon the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy law, loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. So, we get a small inkling of the fact that the law and the things that God has given, the precepts, are important, right? Well, let's go over and see what it says in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5, we, we know it to be the Beatitudes and what, what Jesus says is necessary in and, and everyday life, and, and, but what he really does is he expounds on things. And in chapter 5, verse 16, it starts, we're going to start, and let's read this. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, we are taught that we're saved by grace and that it's not by works. But it's not saying you're not supposed to do good works. It's defining the fact that good works comes from a man who's walking with God. But if you're walking with God but not believing his commandments or his precepts or the testimonies of the word of God, then what are you? You're you're walking around in the days not confused about the very things that God has established as norm. Verse 17 Listen to what Jesus says, please. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. In other words, don't think that I'm here and I'm going to destroy the destroy the law because I'm the I'm the uh, uh, your salvation. I'm the Emmanuel. I am all these things. I am a great prophet. All of these things the people thought they thought he was just a great prophet or he was he was. Uh, uh, someone sent by God, but what they were failing to understand was that Jesus was God. He was God in the flesh come among them, and that was hidden from them so that they wouldn't under that they wouldn't uh, be con, uh, uh, thinking of that. All of a sudden, Jesus was here. Uh, let's make him king, because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to make him king of Israel. 
And that was not in his time and place. He was there for salvation, to bring men all men to the Father. Think that not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come to destroy, not to come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, the things that he was going to teach, that he was going to present to the people around him, was more than just the law, but it didn't destroy the law. It just fulfilled, it made complete the law. So how did it do that? It says in 18, For verily I say unto you, heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shed in no way uh, wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And believe me, it hasn't all been fulfilled yet. The law will not pass away. It's going to be fulfilled in the time when Christ comes back. For verily I say unto you, heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle. In other words, a single period or a single mark over the, over, uh, the uh, Jewish language, the, uh, the, what was written down, how they wrote their, their words, we have a period at the end of the sentence, but they had periods over their letters which meant things, which gave in, uh, intonation to th certain words so that they understood the meaning of those words. And it says, one jot or one tittle will not pass away from the law. In other words, it was perfect in how it was written. It was written by the finger of God, and none of it will pass away. It's going to be fulfilled completely. Where whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, were constantly taught in church, all oh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were evil, and they were this, and they were that. Well, I'm not disagreeing with the fact of their intent. Their intent was to use the law in order to support the fact of their position in their religion, that they were looked up to and honored and glorified and made, made to look higher than what they really were. So they misused the, the commandments, they misused the, the Old Testament in order to make themselves look better. That's not the intent of what the, what the word was. And so because of that, people today teach that the Pharisees and the, and the, and the uh, Sadducees and the scribes were all false. No, no, in the, in the sense that what they taught was correct, in, in obeying the, the word of God, it's just that, what did Jesus say? I have, you know, uh, you can hear and listen to the Pharisees, just don't do what they do, because what they're doing is false, but what they're teaching is true. For I say unto you that, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You are supposed to be listening to and understanding what the commandments were. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old, thou shalt not kill. All right, now this is where Jesus uses the Ten Commandments to establish the truth of the commandments, but to show that he came to fulfill he came to expressly show that the commandments were more than just the words written where it says, thou shalt not kill. He now expounds on that to, to bring us, born-again Christians, those in the new covenant, the new agreement, into equality uh, with what the Old Testament says, so that we can look at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament, and establish our lives on doing the Word of God. 
he heard that it was said of them in old times, thou shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now listen to what Jesus says. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So what Jesus did is he established that there were different levels of the unforgiveness of the, of the anger of what murder really was. It was not just killing your brother, but it was saying things in such a way that it would destroy the relationship that you were supposed to have with a brother. It was destroying the very makeup of what God wanted you to do. It wasn't so much that you were hating and you wanted to murder him. No, but it was speaking in such a way that it would tear him down, that it would cause problems for him, calling him a fool and making him feel like an idiot. When you speak those words, when you said those things, it caused damage to your brother. It caused, when I say brother, that could be the person next door. It could be somebody in school where you think, well, hey, that, that guy's an idiot. You know, that guy's this, that guy's that. Well, when you speak words like that as a father telling the child that he's an idiot or he's stupid, you affect, you put curses on that child. You put curses on that friend. You put curses on them calling them idiots and stupid and fools and stuff. And because of that, they end up having problems their lifelong time. And do you really want to do that? Do you really want to cause somebody so many problems that the rest of their life they feel foolish or stupid or feel like an idiot or feel like they don't have any common sense or feel anything that's derogatory against the Word of God about their life? No. God expects us to, to lift our brother up and minister to him and praying for him and, and asking the Lord's blessing on their life so that they will come out of what they've been in the past and they will end up um, realizing that God is so, so enamored by the fact that they have trusted him and they love him and they want a part with him that you encourage that person. You encourage them to do what? To read the word of God, to listen to the word of God, to sing praises to the word of God, to lift up holy hands to, the, to God himself, to be the men of God that the word of God encourages them to be. And so just to hate somebody, we can say, well, that doesn't murder them. No, but to hate them and to cause problems for them ends up discouraging them and causes them problems. And God was so dis, dis hated it so much that when Christ came, he made it clear that there are different levels of ways of bringing a brother down that were essentially the same as killing him. You were destroying the potential walk of a strong Christian because you told them that they were not capable of talking, that they were not able to do that, that they were stupid, that they were low, that they were this, they were that, instead of encouraging them and saying, hey, listen, you can teach, you can teach the Word of God. You may not have ever done it before, but you can do it. You can give place of praise and glory to our Heavenly Father, and that is teaching. That's encouraging. That's ministering to a person's roots and helping them to understand that they're founded in the Word of God because of God's love, grace, and mercy to our brothers. And so because of that, it is essential that we understand that, that the words we use, the way we treat our brothers and sisters, is, is so highly expected of, of our God to minister to them that God holds it special. 
and he warns us through Christ not to do these things. So he takes the he takes the uh, commandment where it says do, do not kill, and he establishes it even more so. He makes it clear to us how we're supposed to minister to one another by not doing some things, including going so far as to call one a fool, because that destroys a person. It may not kill them physically, but it might kill them spiritually. It might bring them down. It might put curses on their life that they may never get rid of, that they may always fight for the rest of their life trying to overcome because you and I in our uh, weakness have thought that we can uh, show ourselves better than someone else when we call them stupid. Well, if he's stupid, I'm not. See, I'm smarter than he is because he's stupid, so I must be smarter. Well, no, you've, you've really, what you've done is you just brought curses upon yourself because you thought you were better than someone else, so now you've got spirits of pride and arrogance and the rest that have come into you to show you that you are so much better than someone else, when in reality, you're actually worse. You are act- you put yourself under the condemnation of the Lord because now you put someone down instead of building them up. And God wants us to build people up. He wants us to minister to them because they need Christ also. And so it goes on and it says in verse 27, thou shalt not commit adultery. And it goes into great detail about adultery. In 33, it says thou shalt not forswear or make oaths or promises. And we've read about what oaths and promises are, and we, we say to ourselves, oh, well, okay, I, I wouldn't do that. Well, in many cases, we have done that, and we have done those things that we were not supposed to do, and so because of that, we've brought problems not on those around us, although we, we can say we have by causing problems, but we've brought those things upon ourselves. We have taken ourselves out from the protection of God and out from his covenant because we've broken the covenant, we've broken the commandments, we've broken the law, we've broken what God has established, and Jesus made even more so. We've broken that because of the fact that we've decided that sinning is easier than obeying the word of God. It's time that we understand what what the word of God is, what the commandments are, you know, we keep reading about it in Psalm 119. Well, what does what does the law say? What does it say? Do we do we read the law? You know, David did. David read the law frequently, it says. And because of that, he understood what was supposed to be said. That's why when Nathan came up to him and said, You are the man, he knew immediately what he had done. He understood the law and he knew that he was the man that had done the sin, that had caused the death, that had caused the child to die, that had brought uh, the termination of his kingdom because of the fact that everybody had uh, were whispering about the king and what was going on in their life. Well, hey, we can find fault with David, but don't we do the same thing? When we, when we whisper and gossip about our neighbors and our friends and we whisper behind their back and we talk about them, don't we do the same thing? Aren't we putting them down and making ourselves look better? Aren't we feeding the pride, the spirit of pride that's in us that, oh, well, I wouldn't be like that. No, not me. I'm so much better than they are. But we aren't. And so we have to understand what the commandments say. So let's read them in Exodus 20. It says, and God spake all these words. You know, we read that and we don't really get it. We really don't get the full impact of what this sentence just said. And God spake. When God, if God stood, came down and showed himself in your bedroom, your living room, wherever you are where you're sinning and you're not walking in, in his precepts and law, if God came down and spake these words and said, do not 
kill and then explain the, the complete impact of do not kill, do not talk, do not say bad things about your friends, your neighbors, your family, your wife, your children, your mother, your father. If he came and said that to you, would you say, yeah, yeah, well, you know, listen, I, I understand what you're saying, but, uh, you know, kind of go away right now because I'm in myself and I'm doing whatever I want to do. Uh, no, no. If, if God ever came down and stood in your presence and made himself known to you, you'd be like a worm crawling on the ground, just begging him not to, not to take you away and, and do unto you what you deserve because of the fact that our sin is so wretched before him. Our lives are so wretched before him because of the fact that we put so much credence in ourselves, so much, so much acceptance of who and what we are, that we really don't understand when God comes down and says, do not do this. If he said that to you, I guarantee you, you'd have a different concept of the presence of God when he spoke that to you. And he says, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of the Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Wow. When they heard that, they went, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is God. He's the one, not Moses, but he's the one that brought us out of the land of Egypt. And we gave Moses a hard time, but it was God that did that. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, and he looked down, and they were all ready within a short period of time, worshiping, uh, worshiping a golden calf. Because of that was their nature. That's what they had done for 400 years. And they just fell right back into their own sin. We get saved. We get ministered to by the Spirit of God. He comes down and touches us, brings us out of the pit of slime and horror and mess that we're in and have been in all our lives. And the Spirit of God himself comes and says, you need Christ. And we say, yeah, yeah, we do. Because when he exposes us for what we are, we realize how low we really are. And so we come to Christ and we say, I, I need, I, I, please, please, please save me out of the mess I'm in. And he comes and lives inside of us. And he changes us. And he puts his spirit within us. And our spirit comes alive. And all of a sudden, we have a clearness of thought of who God really is. And we, we sometimes cry. We sometimes weep. We sometimes, uh, it's so joyful. We're, we're laughing uncontrollably because of the presence of God in our lives. Because of the presence of God in our lives. Have we missed that since we've gotten saved? Have we missed the importance of God in our lives that we should be humble before him, humble to the point of anything he says to us is so important, it's more than anything in our lives that we should be listening to him and saying, oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that I've sinned. We, we think we can just, you know, lie down in bed because we've had a rough day and kind of close our eyes and kind of cross our hands over our chest and intertwine our fingers. And then we say, you know, God, I, I sinned today and I'm sorry. And I hope you forgive me. And I pray for my dog that, you know, it's okay. And I pray for my cat because I think it coughed up a fur ball and uh, my bird's feathers are falling out. Yeah. We, 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 we are so, we are so weak and unknowing of the presence of God in that we come to him in such a light manner, in such a way that's so weak and, and detestable that it's amazing that God listens to any of us. We, we should be falling on our face before our God and saying, oh my 
God in heaven, please, I have I've sinned this wretched sin again. I have committed a sin against you in heaven. Please, God, forgive me. Please have mercy on me. Bring me out of this, this terrible pit that I've dug for myself. Set me on high. Please, God, do that. Only you can do that. It's, our heart is so encapsulated in the, in the sin that we are part of that it prevents us, it shields us from knowing the true closeness of our God the true love and mercy of our Heavenly Father that wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to be with us. He wants to forgive us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord thy God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, and resteth the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. it he made it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. By the way, none of these were destroyed. They were all fulfilled by Christ. They were made more. They were explained in great detail. God, through Jesus, showed how they were supposed to be done, how they were supposed to be lived every single day. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not cover, covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's, his corvette, his yard, his house, nothing. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they said, ah, well, so what? It's just God. No, no, that's not what it says. They removed. In other words, they got away from it. They were petrified and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, you speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. That gives just a glimpse of what it was like standing in the presence of God. The mountain was smoking, fire erupted from it, the noise, the rumblings, 
They knew it wasn't a volcano. They knew it was God Almighty in his presence, and they were terrified. They had to back up and get away because they were afraid they were going to die. And why? Because they knew their sin was exposed to the Heavenly Father. They knew that. And they said, hey, Moses, you go talk to him and we'll listen to you. We'll listen to what you have to say and we'll understand that God is speaking for us. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, to work with you, to live with you, to make an example to you, to work and be with you at all times, to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. You get that? Our God... is so great that when we truly are walking with him and being in his presence is so majestic, is so amazing, is so wonderful that people, the people got away. They were afraid. Not a reverential fear, although it was probably, there was probably some reverence uh, in there, but they were afraid they were going to die. They were afraid God was going to come down and kill them because of their sins. And why is it so easy for us to sin and not think that God is going to hold us accountable for those things? He died and saved us from our sins, but it doesn't mean that you just wander around going, hey, I think I'll do it again today. You know, he forgave me yesterday. Let's do it again today. Yeah, so he gives us the verses, if we confess. But so few of us even know how to confess. So few of us even come and to acknowledge the sin that we've done. And we think that God's not going to hold us accountable? Trust me, God's going to hold us accountable. He's going to look at us and say, why? Why do you keep doing the same thing I've told you not to do? I've told you not to do this. I've told you not to treat your brothers like this. I've told you not to steal from Walmart." I've told you not to be dishonorable to your mother and father. I've told you not to lie and steal and all these things. And we think, that hey, well, it's okay. God will forgive us if we just confess our sins to him. So, so I've got that in my back pocket. And then whenever I sin, I can just pull that out, read that scripture, you know, and God forgives me. Uh, I don't think it works that way. And I'm pretty sure that when God established it through Christ, that is even more intense than what it says in Exodus 20, that God holds us accountable for the way we walk in his Holy Spirit. He expects us to do better than yesterday. He expects us to walk in his Spirit. He expects us to walk in his precepts. He expects us to walk in the Ten Commandments by doing those things that the Holy Spirit has revealed. He didn't, Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law. He wasn't destroying anything. He was fulfilling it. He was making it known that it was something that they still had to do, and he continues in in Matthew describing the way that we're supposed to walk with him and deal with the people around us and deal with the situations in our life. Take heed, in verse 9, "Therefore, therefore, according to thy word, with my whole heart shall I have sought thee. Oh, let me not Wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. 
I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Every bit of what we just read this morning is the word of God. It's what he expects us to do. Not fall back on 1 John 1, 9, thinking we can do all these things, but to fall on 1, 9 when we have blown it and made mistakes and not just cover ourselves up and say, ah, well, you know, it's all, it's all good now. No, we should be so contrite. We should be so to the point of knowing that our sin brings death upon us and others as we are examples of what we're supposed to be to those around us, and we give place to other people saying, well, if he did it, I can do it. He's a Christian. Why can't I do it? If he can do it, why shouldn't I be able to do it? It's that kind of life that causes destruction on our brothers and our sisters. We are supposed to be held higher We are supposed to be held to a point where we are walking with our God. And how can we walk with him, folks, if we don't believe his commandments and his precepts and his laws and his testimonies, how he walks with us, how he ministered to the Jews and brought them out of Israel with his love and compassion and that he showed them taking them across the Red Sea, taking them through the Jordan River, taking them through a desert for 40 years and providing for all their needs. And can we say that he doesn't take care of our needs? Can we say that he doesn't provide for us whenever we need him to? No. He may not heal that pimple on your cheek, but... There's more things involved in your life than whether you have a pimple on your cheek or if you have a minor deformation. That does not bring death, but sin does. Sin does. Sin does. It brings death. And what God says over and over and over in Psalm 119 is, my commandment my precepts, my statutes, my testimonies, have respect unto thy ways. I'm going to respect you, Lord. I'm going to respect your word. I'm going to respect what you've said, and I am not going to continue to live for myself. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to do what you want me to do, and I'm going to do that today. And Give me the strength to do it tomorrow and the next day until you come. Give me the ability to overcome the sin in my life and to stop doing it. I don't want to do it anymore because it brings me down and it destroys my relationship with you, Father. I am not being the friend I'm supposed to be. I'm not serving you the way I'm supposed to serve you. And I call myself a Christian. And I call myself a friend, and I call Jesus my Savior, and I call God my Heavenly Father, and yet I keep doing the same things over and over. When is it going to stop? When am I going to put my foot down and say, no more? He gives me the strength and the gives me the ability to overcome the enemy in all wickedness and all high places, he puts me high above them with his power, with his glory, with his presence, with his spirit, and I am falling to the same thing day after day. I'm going to put my foot down, and I'm going to stop this rat race. I'm going to stop this mad running around in circles and doing the same thing every day because... I am going to serve my God today. 
I am going to treat him like he should be treated and honor him and honor his word today in my life. When he looks down, he is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to be faithful today. I'm going to be faithful to the word of God and do, and do what he wants me to do. I can do it because he gives me his spirit to help me do it, and I'm going to do it. Amen? Amen. That's what I've got today. Let's come up here. No.
why isn't this shutting off? Oh, Lord. I gotta clean this up. Nothing's working. 